The Power Factor Show with Rick, Steve, and Caleb. Episode 40. Gun Rights Radio Network has the best pro-Second Amendment, pro-gun rights podcast available on the net. The podcasts are absolutely free when subscribing using iTunes or Zoom Marketplace. Or if you want, you can just listen from the website. Make sure you visit GunRightsRadio.com to subscribe. Podcasting freedom, one episode at a time. Brought to you by Safari Land. You start this. You and do the intro on this. Oh, one. I get to do the intro. Welcome to the Power Factor Show. I'm Caleb. I'm Rick. And Steve is still in Spain on the nude beaches. Yeah. We'll, we'll just, we don't don't think yeah, about that too yeah, too long. Yeah. Think don't about, don't try to visualize. No. No. Think just think about the show. Think about what we're going to talk about tonight, which is guns. Right. And specifically, it's good that Spain. Uh, Spain. Good that Steve's in Spain for this because we're going to talk about a sport he knows nothing about, which is IDPA. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. So tonight we're looking at uh, ESP, which is actually there. I'll stop. Not extrasensory perception. We're not talking about aliens or anything like that, but rather enhanced service pistol, which is IDPA's sort of redheaded stepchild division for. It's really where the guns they don't know what to do with go. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting because you can shoot almost all of the guns from the other divisions in, in ESP. ESP. Yeah, I mean absolutely. it's kind of a it's a catch-all for stuff that doesn't really fit anywhere else, but they also allow all those other guns from elsewhere to play in ESP as well. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, you see, I think, a greater variety of guns in ESP than in all the other divisions. Interestingly enough, and because of that sort of uh, all-inclusiveness of it, it's also the second most popular division in IDPA. If you look at the numbers of shooters, and I'm just basing this off nationals because uh, I don't have the data from every state match, but if you look at the number of shooters at the uh, standard and the indoor nationals for the past uh, three or four years, SSP is always the most popular. And ESP is the second most popular. And again, I think that's because, you know, uh, whatever gun you have, it's probably legal for ESP. And also, a tiny, tiny little modification on your SSP gun makes it an ESP gun as well. I also think there's an element of expense because mm -hmm. I would say five years ago, CDP was the second most popular. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the expense of shooting 45 auto has kind of relegated it to third place. And uh, you're seeing a lot of, even the people who love their 1911s, Instead of switching over to a Glock, they're switching over to a 9 millimeter 1911 yep. and shooting that in ESP. And so what we're kind of going to kind of look at is uh, just a variety of guns that work very well for ESP. And we're going to start with the gun that, in my opinion, I think was what they had in mind when they thought of ESP. Because if you look at SSP and look at the rules, it's very clearly set up for, you know, double action autos, CDP is obviously designed for 1911s. And then you get to ESP, which says single action guns in nine millimeter or others. And if you think about that, the most common one of those is? Browning high power. And also it uh, holds 10 rounds comfortably. Mm -hmm. um, ESP, the main distinction between ESP and SSP is you're allowed the single action trigger, right. higher, higher gun weight which is kind of interesting um, that I'm not sure what gun they were thinking of when they set the weight limit yeah. at 43 ounces. Because the high power weighs about uh, uh, 35, I think. And even your, uh, I guess your 9 millimeter 1911s, if they're all festooned with uh, magwells and full length guide rods and stuff, weigh mm -hmm. 43 ounces. But those guns weren't around in 1996. Not, not nearly with the prevalence that they are today. And so I'm wondering where that weight limit came from. Maybe it was like the Llama something or got uh this now when you've got me thinking now if you're watching uh saving private ryan for example well this is a really good example of where this happens the scene where tom hanks shoots the tank with his 1911 yeah that's not a 1911 that's a star that's oh, yeah. chambered in nine millimeter and if you look closely you can see the blasphemous external extractor on it that john moses browning never would have put on a gun because that's not what god told him to do well his early guns actually right. did have them but yeah, you know, anyway he, he outgrew that and yeah. went to the internal extractor so that may have been what they had in mind, but the Browning High Power really became the uh, kind of the flagship for the high cap single action gun for quite some time. While, with that being said, though, we still have had lots of other types of 1911s, especially that have been uh, that you'll see in ESP, and we've got some examples of those here as well. Now, I shot this year. I shot ESP most of the summer, and I shot the High Power. 
Um, but a few years ago, I shot the whole season with a 38 Super uh, 1911. I, I'm convinced that the, the platform was designed for a cartridge um, of approximately 1.25 inch mm -hmm. length. And that would be the 45 Auto, 38 Super, and 10 millimeter all fall in that length. And the action is designed to feed a cartridge of that length. The magazine is dimensioned to feed a cartridge of that length. And I think the gun runs best. Uh, I know of people who have enduring, usually feed issues with nine yes. millimeters. Um, I know people also that, oh, I've had one for 50 years and it's never missed a beat. And I've heard that about Yugos and Hyundais as well, but I, that doesn't necessarily mean that's gonna be your experience. So I prefer to use the, the 38 Super, although as popular as the 38 Super is and has been in Ipsic, it's nowhere in IDPA. It's um, very true. It's kind of an orphan. Yeah, you won't see a lot of uh, 38 Super guns in IDPA, although I actually agree with Rick that if you're looking for a sub-45 caliber 1911 uh, and you don't need to worry about making major power factor, which we'll talk about the rules of ESP here in a bit, but after we get done talking about all these cool guns we have, but uh, one of the things about ESP is that the power factor is the same as SSP. So you're looking at minor power factor guns. So if you're not worried about power factor, but you want a more reliable 1911 platform, I really recommend a 38 Super for that. They feed well. Again, the action, like Rick said, is designed for that longer OAL cartridge. Uh, when you get down to guns like this, this is a Para LTC 9mm. This was uh, originally designed by Para as a carry gun. Uh, it actually has an alloy frame. Uh, it does not normally come with the Crimson Trace laser grips or the Bomar style rear sight. This gun was worked over by, at the time, Para's shooter Todd Jarrett into a much more competition friendly gun. I've used this a lot in Steel Challenge and this actually was my first uh, ESP gun as well. And I've had it for, gosh, uh, four years now. And it's definitely seen some miles. When you get down into these nine millimeter guns, you have to do a little bit more work to get them to run reliably. And this one even will not feed certain types of hollow point ammunition. But the advantage to nine millimeter over 38 Super is that the cost of ammunition is much cheaper. Uh, this gun is fairly light when compared to a 38 Super, it's got a little bit less weight. So if you're the kind of guy who shoots a Glock or something like that and is used to driving a lighter gun, around the courses of fire, a nine mil, maybe an alloy frame might be something that you're looking for. Uh, Para has discontinued this model of 1911. They are fairly difficult to find actually, but you can still get alloy frame nine mil 1911s out there. I believe, um, gosh, doesn't Kimmer make one or is that a 45? Uh, I'm sure they do. But it probably doesn't yeah. work. So yeah, yeah. Uh, that there's a, that's a problem with that. But they also make a super and that one might work. They do. And that one actually probably will work. And then of course we have the, well, we're not gonna get to that. Well, that I was just wanting to get at your mag there. Oh. Does that have a spacer in the back? No, actually not? this is a Wilson Combat 45 ACP mag. Oh, okay. and I, it just fits in the gun. It, it, yeah, it happens to fit it's in that gun. Okay. Interestingly enough, this will also fit a 40 Smith & Wesson cartridge, this exact mag. And if you are not paying attention, you could put a 40 in here, stick it in your nine mil, and then when you try to feed it, just create all sorts of weird, silly problems. Don't ask me how I know that, but trust me, that can actually happen. I've heard of that. Yeah, yeah I, I heard about a guy yeah. who did that while who he was dry guy. firing. Yeah. Well, the nine millimeter mag, the interesting thing is mm -hmm. the nine millimeter mag continues to evolve. Yeah, I mean, it it's does. just like every couple of years, somebody comes out with a new nine millimeter mag and this is the one that's gonna work. Right. And then every couple of years, then it's replaced by another, no, this is the one that's gonna work. And that's, that's why I contend that the 38 Super Mags that they're making today are pretty much like the ones that they were making 30 years ago and yeah. they haven't really changed much. But the nine mag is continually evolving and uh, I don't think it's probably stopped yet. I think probably your best bet for nine mags are gonna be the Wilson ETM mags. They're 10 rounds and uh, a zillion dollars. It's like buying HK P7 mags, honestly. Speaking of the HK P7, that is probably one of the guns that's legal for ESP that you don't see very often. Well, uh, it used it initially it was uh, I think SSP legal. Really? And then they decided that the squeeze cocker uh, c turned it into essentially the act of squeezing it turned it into a single action. Ah, of course. And then they they put it and I believe it resides in ESP today. Now, one of the things obviously that I'm big on uh, here on the show and on Gun Nuts and everywhere else is style points. And I, I firmly believe that if you're not gonna win, you should look good losing. And I think one of the best ways to look awesome while you're, if you're not gonna win is with a 10 mil. 
That is something that is one of the ongoing confounding rules <laughs> issues of IDPA. It really is. Um, when, the, when the division rules were uh, developed in the 90s, um, the, the calibers were essentially broken out based on their factory mm -hmm. power levels. And so you had, four, in auto pistol divisions, CDP consisted of 45 auto, 10 millimeter, 400 corbon. Which is cool. And I don't know what else would have I fit think that in was there. It. I think at it was the just time. Those three, I mean, I'm sure yeah. 451 Daytonix Magnum, you know, would have, would have fit in there. But it was for high powered, essentially, uh, you know, practical pistols. You weren't going to shoot your Desert Eagle there, but... Because um, it won't fit in the box. Yeah. Somebody at some point apparently whispered in Bill Wilson's ear and said, you know, if you let 10 millimeter stick around in CDP, people are going to, you know, they're, they're, he, somebody convinced him that the recoil impulse uh, characteristics of the gun were going to cause a mass migration to the 10 millimeter cartridge. The 45 would be dead. Wilson didn't make any 10 millimeters, so they banned effectively banned 10 millimeter by moving it to ESP. Instead of doing the logical thing and making a 10 millimeter gun. Yeah, yeah, which they do now. <laughs> right. But the, the main issue with moving the 10 millimeter to ESP Sorry, is the, the power floor uh, for ESP is 125,000 power factor, which is about equivalent to factory nine millimeter. Mm -hmm. uh, you can buy factory 10 millimeter ammo with a power factor of about 225,000. So you, you know, who's gonna shoot their nine round uh, elephant gun in ESP against the guys who are shooting the pop guns. Right. And, and I occasionally will shoot this gun with full power ammo. Just and, and I I send Bill a text message every time I do it <laughs> so that he knows I'm shooting a 10 mil yeah, in today, ESP. Pal. Yeah. But anyway, so the 10 millimeter belongs in ESP according to the rules. Although belongs. if you look at the principles of IDPA that say we're shooting full power ammo should be in should, CDP. Yeah, it should be in CDP. So should the not. 40 actually, which, and again, and this, the same. we may disagree on this one a little yeah. bit, but I really feel like, and again, there's another round. My second ESP gun after the para was oddly enough, another para. And this was the para 1640, which is the high cap, uh, wide body, 16 round wide body para, uh, chambered in 40 Smith and Wesson, which again made Factory 40 Smith & Wesson ammo makes a, you know, 185, 190 power factor, depending on the load, or 185,000 for IDPA. And, but because, again, of the rules, it's placed in ESP, where unless I download, I'm competing against guys who are shooting, you know, 9 millimeter pop guns. Uh, I really feel that 40 and 10 mil and 450 Corbon and, you know, all those crazy other, you know, rounds do belong in CDP with major power factor rounds. Now I gotta ask you, when you shoot that 10 mil, how, how many times do people say, what are you shooting? Just about every time. Yeah. Yeah, they always, and they always wondering how come the brass is in the next bay instead of this bay, <laughs> that kind of thing. But. The brass actually goes up, achieves escape velocity, yeah. and then goes around the earth before it comes back down into the bay next to you. Yeah. Now, so. One of the guns I really feel that has been in part popular for the uh, resurgence and the spike in participation in ESP is uh, the Springfield Armory XD. Now, what we have here is the latest and greatest version of the XD. Uh, the XD is available in two specific base models, the XD and the XDM, where the M stands for more awesome. I actually think it's match, but I like my uh, version better. One of the big differences between the M series and the standard XD is that when you take the M apart, you don't have to pull the trigger to break the gun down, unlike a certain other polymer pistol out there that's yeah. manufactured. Yeah. Now, the reason this gun is in ESP is because uh, the ATF, when this gun was first being imported, decided for some reason that it was a single action and that it was functionally different than all the other striker fired guns on the market. The reason for that is when this gun is in battery and, oh boy, I broke it. There we go. When this gun is in battery and the striker is prepped, all the trigger pull is doing is releasing the striker. So there's no, so unlike the Glock where you're taking maybe 10% out of the spring weight of the striker when you press this trigger, there, you, all this does is release the striker on the gun. So I guess technically it is a single action, but that seems kind of silly to me. That notwithstanding, the early XDs uh, were available in four inches and then a five inch gun and then a uh, three and a 
half inch compact. Uh, those were all classified as ESP. Uh, a couple of years, four or five years ago, Springfield came out with the M versions, which had a uh, slightly different slide profile. They had better factory sights. Those all had high knees from the factory and a match barrel. And then just this year, they released, released the new XDM uh, 5.25, which is their dedicated competition model. For people that use Glocks, you've noticed probably it looks a little similar to some of the things that you used to seeing on your Glock 34. Uh, so it has the XD grip safety, which is the dumbest part in the history of mankind. Uh, but otherwise, it retains a lot of the XD features. It's got an adjustable rear sight, a fiber optic front sight, and I think... Uh, this is probably going to be pretty popular in ESP, I think, in the upcoming few years. Now, is that, that that's a 9? Is that available now only in 9? Uh, currently, it's available in 9, and interestingly enough, uh, just last week, they launched a 45 ACP model, oh, okay. which would be legal for CDP. Okay. So if you want or to shoot... ES or or yeah. ESP, yeah. yeah. So if you want to shoot, if you've got a, if you've got a 45 ACP uh, and you want to shoot that, you're ready to go. Uh, the XDM that I have here, this does take the exact same mags as the standard XDM, the non-match version. So it has 19 rounds of 9mm. Uh, obviously for ESP, you're only going to load 10 of those delicious rounds unless you want 9 procedurals. But... Uh, Again, you've got a lot of capacity. You can actually do a lot with these guns. They've got interchangeable back straps, a bunch of other fun stuff on them. Uh, and they, this one has held up remarkably well. I shot it at Steel Challenge. I put, uh, in the course of the last month, I put about 6,000 rounds on it and cleaned it. Well, I think I cleaned it. So we won't talk about that or our producer will get really, really sad. <laughs> now, one of the things we mentioned more than once is that Although the guns we're kind of touching on here, the 9 millimeters and the 38 Supers, those are the cartridges and the guns that are ideal for ESP because mm -hmm. of the power floor and whatnot. But any of the guns that are legal for SSP or CDP are, are legal also for legal ESP. for ESP. And, yep. and so you'll see people, um, you could shoot your 8 round 45 or your uh, 40 caliber. 40 is a weird cartridge in... in uh, IDPA because yeah. you don't get the benefit of the extra power exactly. compared to the nine like you do shooting major in uh, USPSA. So if you have a 40 caliber gun, um, you uh, especially if it were an XD, uh, the only place you could play is ESP. Would be ESP, yep. Um, it's not legal for SSP. It's not legal for CDP. So 40, you see all the 40s kind of mingling there in uh, ESP division. But if you're shooting factory ammo. You know, you're shooting way more power than necessary. And if you're shooting something like a single stack 45, you're not getting the advantage of the allowed 10 round capacity limit um, if you're only loading eight round mags. But you can play there if you want. So one of the neat things about ESP, like we were mentioning though, is that uh, you can take your SSP gun and shoot it exactly the same in ESP. Uh, when I was shooting for a five gun master, I actually shot the SSP master qualification and then I went back and reloaded all my mags and prepped everything up and took the exact same gun, which was a Smith & Wesson M&P 40 Pro Series and shot ESP Master in the same day. I was just, you know, having a good day. So I figured, you know what? I shot an 80 something on the SSP. I'll try it again on ESP. Right. But the assumption in IDPA is that ESP is faster, but there's some things that you can do to a gun in that's an SSP gun uh, to trick it out for ESP. For example, if you have a Glock, which a lot of uh, you guys out there do, and you do, and you add a mag well to it. It's still legal for IDPA, assuming that it and the mag makes the box, but that's immediately going to put it in SSP, or it's going to put it in ESP. Uh, similarly, any sort you're of. Enhancing it. Right. It is now an enhanced service pistol because you see so many service pistols with big ass brass mag wells on it. Right, exactly. Uh, and also, any external cosmetic modification to the gun is going to make it an ESP gun. So, for example, assuming for the moment that this XD was a it was legal for SSP, which it's not. Don't send me any emails about that, please. Uh, if I were to do uh, any sort of stippling or checkering in a place where that wasn't legal for SSP, it would still be legal for IDPA, but it would then become an ESP gun. Similarly. Uh, one of the things you'll see for Glocks a lot of the time are aftermarket slides from companies like Lone Wolf. The Lone Wolf aftermarket slides for Glocks have forward cocking serrations. 
there are no forward cocking serrations on the Glock factory slides, so IDPA HQ has determined that the gun is still legal for IDPA with that slide on it, but in ESP division, yeah. not SSP division. That makes sense. So it's very easy to take your SSP gun and do you know one or two cosmetic or minor modifications, and then it is a, a fairly well set up ESP gun. And it's, it's interesting to note that at the last uh, couple of indoor nationals, ESP was won by Bob Vogel, who was shooting a Glock. So the days of ESP being dominated, again, by, you know, kind of those 10-round uh, single-stack 9mm race guns are definitely definitely coming to a close. You see a lot of Glocks, a lot of M&Ps, and a lot of uh, XDs now in ESP. And this is sort of apart from the technical specifications of the division. But somebody sent me an email today and asked me, um, in USPSA, if you're uh, shoot, if you you go to Chrono, mm -hmm. you shoot minor, you you just get scored minor for the rest of the match, right? right? And he said, yeah. He goes, well, what happens in uh, IDPA if you don't make power factor? Your match is over. Yeah, it's a DQ uh, because there's nowhere to go. You don't have uh, major and minor within the same division, so it's not like I declared major. Uh oh, you made minor, so we'll just recalculate all your scores based on minor. Uh, if it's a if it's a, a division with a power factor of 125,000, you don't make it, you're done. And uh, the one exception to that that we have made in the past is if you're shooting CDP, with it, which used to have a weight limit of 41 ounces, right? and your gun weighed more than 41 ounces, you would get to go to ESP. Bump you to ESP. Yep. And that's the, there's nothing in the rule book about that, but if you have a classification in both divisions and your gun makes weight, you're in ESP. There's mm -hmm. nothing in the rules that says it's okay to move somebody. But I, uh, being of my you know naturally charitable nature, uh, have done that more than once. But that's about the only way. The only way you're going to survive not making power factor is uh, um, if you're shooting in CDP. You can get bumped to this catch-all division of ESP, and it's yeah. another way that it can save you even if you don't plan to shoot it. You know, and what's interesting when you look at ESP, uh, if you look at the mindset behind the creation of ESP, and I often sit around, you know, in the wee hours of the morning and wonder what Bill Wilson and, you know, the guys were thinking when they came up with some of this stuff, usually after I've been drinking. Uh, and you look at ESP, you know, look at the classifier times. Obviously, at the time that they came up with the classifiers, uh, they thought that SSP would be the slowest division, mm -hmm. would not counting the revolver divisions, which are populated by wackos and very awesome people. Well, at least one. Uh, but when you look at the classification time for SSP, it is not significantly shorter than the classification time for the revolver division. It's maybe three or four seconds. So they clearly thought that shooting a double single uh, auto was a huge disadvantage. Well, don't you think that when they were thinking about what people were going to be shooting, they were probably thinking like Walther P38, right? Not uh, or Smith not, and Wesson, you know? Yeah, not a half third pound uh, trigger on your. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's like the guns. The the rules were based on the guns that were available in the mid '90s, mm -hmm. and and stock service pistol was going to be a place for. Uh, third generation Smith and Wessons, and Beretta ninety two, Beretta ninety two, and stuff like that. And I don't think there was any sense that we were going to have two pound triggers on our Glocks um, with short resets, and mm -hmm. you know that the guns were going to evolve to this thing. I mean, I, I, I think the idea that the guns should be divided by action type makes sense, but action type has become blurred to the extent mm. that I think the divisions need some revisions. Yeah. Well, and again, a good example of that, to go back to the XD, the XD's trigger feels pretty much the same as a Glock or an M&P trigger. You know, there, there's differences between every single one of them. I prefer, if I were to rank them, I would say XD, Glock, M&P. But, you know, the XD is technically a single action. So again, we have that blurring of action types and divisions. And ESP has, again, become sort of a repository for the gamer guns and the red-headed stepchildren of IDPA. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, I, it's funny. I shot my high power this year. I'm not even really sure why. I think it's because our generous host, Safariland, gave me a holster for my high power. Mm. I think that's really what drove it. And I, I, I enjoy shooting it. It's a classic gun, but I just don't shoot it very well. Um, I mean, as an example, last year at our state match, I finished second expert in CDP, shooting my old favorite, 1911. I went to ESP this year and finished like fifth sharpshooter. And it's just, it's a nice gun, but I think if I changed to 
an SP01, mm-hmm. any anything other than a 1911, I'm just not going to shoot it as well. And yep. if you've grown up shooting Glocks, I mean, I think there's a, there's now generations of people yep. who don't have this that don't have this sense of attachment to the 1911. That anybody who's you know 40 or 50 years old or older than that, you know, I mean, my the first pistol I ever shot was a 1911. The first pistol I ever owned was a 1911. And you know, you have entire generations now that look at 1911s as something that you saw on reruns of the Untouchables or something. I mean, it's just like <laughs> you know, it might as well be a bonanza. You know, I mean, it's just. Uh, it's uh, there. something that's fairly archaic and everybody now is you know that if it's not a plastic frame and it doesn't have a go boink when you pull the trigger it's not a real gun now speaking of the burning high power if i may uh, uh again to go back to style points this gun is well it's awesome uh one of the problems that it suffers from for a from a competition gun standpoint is the magwell is not generously sized uh for Usually a lot of guys will say that double stacks have an advantage over your single stack guns and that the magwell is wider and it's easier to hit. The problem with the Browning high power mag and magwell is that there's not enough taper at the top of the mag and there's no bevel on the bottom of this magwell. But what I was actually going to get around to is if you were looking for a really cool double stack 40 for style points, the Browning high power, when they made this in 40 Smith & Wesson, they actually re-engineered the gun. It wasn't one of those where, uh, like, oh, I don't know, uh, like a lot of companies will make a 9 and they'll make a 40 because that's expected. When they did the 40 Smith & Wesson versions of these, they actually redesigned and beefed up the internal locking mechanisms. The slides are dimensionally wider. And while a lot of people complain about the snappiness and the harsh recoil of a 40 Smith & Wesson, through a browning high power, it is actually a really pleasant and generally fun round to shoot. So if you ever see one, they're available used. Every now and then, you know, a few new ones will drop. And get one with the Commander Hammer, uh, but they are out there, and they're actually pretty cool. If they just didn't have this mag release, uh, this mag disconnect safety, it'd be the coolest gun ever. I had a Canadian uh, safety officer threaten to DQ me if I modified my mags so that they would drop out. The problem is there's a spring-loaded plunger on the back of the trigger that bears on the front of the magazine, and that is what creates the magazine disconnector. Mm-hmm. So when the mag is out, the plunger pops out, the action doesn't work. Well, if you polish the front of the magazine tube and you polish the little plunger and you, you don't squeeze the gun too hard, you can get the mags to drop out. And this guy was telling me that that is actually a design feature of the gun, again, so you don't lose the magazine. The magazine is not supposed to drop out. It's supposed to drop out just enough that you then have to grab it because then it's more likely that you put it in your pocket rather than let it drop on the ground and leave it. And he said, if your magazines come out when you hit that button, you're FTDR, pal. And I think he was kidding. I think he was kidding. But somebody also told me that the thing that Browning designed to overcome that was what they call the mousetrap yeah. magazine. He's telling me those aren't legal, that IDPA banned, specifically banned the mousetrap magazines. And those are mags that have a little um, wire spring built into the base of them. So that as you press the mag into the gun, it compresses, it compresses this little spring. So when the mag is empty, you hit the button, and that compressed spring overcomes the drag from this, uh, what the guy calls a magazine break that's supposed to hold the mag in there. And somebody said it's like, it, it, I, I still don't understand the reasoning, but they said that those mousetrap mags are illegal too. So This is my incredulous face. Yeah. Yeah, here I am very happy. Here I am very sad. Here I am incredulous. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, so the high power is fun gun, but, you know. Not ideal for competition. Not ideal, especially because of the crappy three white dot sight. Watch our sights episode if you want to hear about the crappy three dot sights. That's about it for IDPA's ESP division. I really think it's a fun division to shoot. Uh, it's a great place to test out modifications for your guns that wouldn't be legal in CDP or uh, SSP. And if a lot of guns that have been modified for USPSA production have things on them that are not at all legal for IDPA SSP. So if you've got a production gun and you're kind of not sure if it's going to be legal for SSP and you don't want to get, you know, uh, DQ'd or anything like that, just declare ESP and have fun with it. I think it's a great division to shoot. Uh, I hope to see more people shoot it, except less at the upcoming IDPA National Championships because I'm shooting it there. So don't shoot it there. If you're going to IDPA Nats in Florida, uh, which will actually have happened 
uh, once this episode airs, that will have already happened. So in the future past, don't shoot ESP at IDPA Nationals. But I think that's it for this episode. I, yeah, I think that's definitely it for this episode. <laughs> so until next time, we'll have Steve back, hopefully next time. Hopefully. Next time, Steve will be here. Uh, if you want to contact us, uh, powerfactorshow.com or send us an email at powerfactorshow at gmail.com or on Facebook. At facebook.com slash powerfactorshow. Don't forget the slash. See you guys next week. <laughs>